Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Tuesday Night Live, brought to you by Crowcast. Very warm welcome to everyone joining us on the chat this evening, and also a warm welcome to my co-panellists tonight. We have Peter J. How are you going, Pete? Good, mate. How are you going? Very, very good. Uh, Nikki, you got your voice back, which everyone's very happy about, obviously. <laughs> Except for Macca. Well, you know, he's probably no often. Uh, and speaking of Macca, how are you going, mate? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm good, thanks, but uh, Nicky's right. <laughs> yeah, well, lots to talk about, I guess. It's uh, not, not a very good uh, good week uh, from the Crows' perspective, um, but let's right, get right into it with some news, shall we? Yes. Did I hear a donkey? I was about to say, was that the donkey voice I heard? That was a donkey. That was a donkey awaking jet lag slumber. What was that stupid sound effect? Uh, that was that was not me. I have no idea what that was. <laughs> that sounded like somebody's phone from two thousand and three. I know that was really weird. <laughs> whose was Very it? Weird. Come on, own up. Whose no, no, was no. it? Nikki. Not me. I'm betting Macca. Bloody Macca, he's gone quiet. My phone's off. Oh, whatever. <laughs> anyway, uh, Pete, let's hook into some news, shall we? Yeah, look, uh, probably uh, the, the biggest news around the place at the moment, of course, was um, Dusty Martin's successful uh, appeal at the tribunal, had his uh, his uh, elbowing charge uh, downgraded and um, to medium impact, and so it's now just one match suspension. Uh, so he gets one match shaved off of that. So he'll miss the Port Adelaide game along with uh, Rance, Rewalt and uh, Trent Cochin all out of that game as well. So that's going to be really interesting to see how the Tigers respond without uh, those four superstars in their side. Um, other news today, Connor Rosie, uh, unsurprisingly, was given the uh, rising star nod with his uh, pretty impressive five goal, 19 possession, 13 score involvements uh, game on um, uh, on Saturday night. Uh, pretty amazing. So uh, well done to Connor. Uh, very, very good game. Um, so that was uh, some interesting news tonight. Also, um, I did get a, a bit of a, a whiff of uh, news. Uh, was, I think it was late this afternoon or early evening that um, the Crows have already discounted recalling Hugh Greenwood this week. Apparently he needs another week in the sandful. Not quite there yet. Um, so I'm sure that'll please a lot of people. Um, so that was from Mick Godden. Um, so yeah, interesting, yeah. Uh, interesting. He didn't uh, do enough, take. Pete. Watching oh, being, at, the, no, being at the game on Friday, he really didn't do enough. Well, I watched the game as well. I, I watched the game as well, and don't even get me started because you got people running around the, in the ones getting twelve possessions, and so we uh, and and those, and those guys we can bring back off of no preseason at all, and with barely any kind of trial match. But that's okay. We can have them back. And they uh, they get twelve possessions, and we can play them. But um, anybody else, you need six months in the twos. Um, so well, good. Well, El- Ellis Yoman and Paholki deserve a call up before Greenwood oh, at the moment, though, from the two. So those care. two actually play quite well. I don't care who it is, but anyway, I'm really, really grumpy. So I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm best. I'm very, very grumpy about football at the moment. So I'll just uh, try and I'll try and just keep. I'll choose happy. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to choose happy. Well, just a question: who, who comes out for Greenwood? Anyone? No, it can't be anyone. We're already slow as bloody mud. Mm. Well, whoever it happens to, well, you know, whoever, whatever changes they make. I mean, the reality is, 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 is and then look, I'm sure that you know we should be onto this later in the show. But um, you and I, we both know that there'll be minimal changes, and uh, they'll just the seedsman will be out. It'll be one force change. Uh, and that'll be it. Or, or I think they're going to test source tomorrow as well. So there, there may well be. There may well be two. But I would tip just one. Whose bloody time. phone is that? Oh, bloody Mrs. Mecca. Get just taken out the room. She... <laughs> <laughs> and he denied it. She, but it's she... obviously in the room with him and he didn't hear it. No, he didn't actually well, didn't... deny it. He said his phone was off. <laughs> Trying to protect the missus. And... Mrs. Macca, we'll do our own sound effects. Thanks very much. Bloody hell. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in there? And uh... oh, the, the dusty one I found kind of interesting, the whinge they had afterwards that 
um, about they need to have a chat to the umpires. They need to look after Dusty a bit more. He needs a few more frees. Oh. I, I'm sorry. No, he doesn't. Everybody's figured him out and he's slowed up. And actually, Richmond might perform better without him. No. What are you talking about? Yeah, I don't think I don't think they'll perform better without him, but they just don't. He's just um he's a protected species and he's been palming people in the face for years and he doesn't like it when he gets a bit of attention back and acts like a sook. And he's he should have actually got rubbed out, I reckon, about uh, in two thousand seventeen. He played a game on the G against Brisbane and the tagger who niggled him, I think, got a week and he probably should have got one back, but but he was dusty and that doesn't happen to Dusty and he's finally got a bit of cover up and so good on him. Yeah, the doggy. I hundred percent agree with you. I, I think that uh, he he was he acted like a sook. I mean, he was barely get he's barely out of touch all bloody year, and he he's well he hadn't laid a tackle before this game. And uh, look, I, it's his problem. He hasn't he hasn't done uh, enough work or whatever he hasn't he hasn't done. He's not putting in enough effort. He's been hanging out waiting to get received the ball. He's got frustrated because he's got a guy tagging living daylights out of him. That, that happens to all the good players, and uh, I would have given him another one for appealing. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Um, interesting one for mine is what Fremantle are going to do with Nat Fife, because anyone who saw that head clash and the aftermath would uh, suggest quite strongly that he will miss at least a week. Um, but he's listed as a test uh, on the Fremantle um, injury list. And uh, it's. I mean, v- sorry, go on. Yeah, they, they do have to test him. They've got to test him during the week. So they're right in that respect that that's what he's listed as. Um, but I agree with you, Fane. Um, the way the eyes roll back in the head, you know, and you had that stiff arm action happening. It's just straight away, it was like, yep, no, nah, that's an automatic at least a week rest yep. for him. Yep. Yeah, oh, look, I'm with you, Nicky, because uh, that's one of the most sickening uh, front-on head blows I've seen because they actually, I, I, the other guy must have a head made of rock because they just, their heads just went bashed and uh, at, at full tilt going for the ball, both going for the ball and uh, seeing, not seeing a damn thing but the ball, giving it 100%, but they've, uh, one must have either, either lucky where it hit on the head or a head made of rock and poor old... Uh, Five. He went down like a sack of spuds, and as you said, Nicky, he, he went through all the spasm of, uh, of of concussion with the stiff arms and all the rest of it. And uh, uh, no, sensibly, with the in, in the day and in the environment we're in here now, and in these days, a little bit more learned about concussion, although they're not fully learned. Uh, really, I think he really should miss the game. And I, I even thought the same about Rockwood because I mean, he went through a very nasty concussion as well. I thought. Right, Macca, your sin bin, mate. Sorry. What's that for? So much noise going on in the background there, we can't even hear ourselves speak. So uh, your sin bin for a little while until Mrs Macca finishes the dishes. Uh, what other news <laughs> have we got? Did uh, you talk about Sunday night, the um, the whole Dean Bailey Melbourne tanking no. stuff that broke through the week? No, <laughs> we don't talk about news on Sunday night. Well, that was... Uh, just an astonishing um, development, I thought. And um, I thought Caroline Wilson summed it up pretty well last night on Footy Classified, actually. And um, just an appalling set of circumstances, you know, whereby clearly, you know, it's it's emerged that the whole uh, the tanking thing it certainly did exist. It was at board level. And, um, you know, no, no doubt, as we all suspected, that Dean Bailey was nothing but a scapegoat and Chris Connolly nothing but scapegoats. Um, and um, just a, you know, I mean, we get up here and we bag the AFL on a week-to-week basis, but, gee, they make it easy, don't they? Well, I mean, what recourse do you reckon the Bailey family have against Melbourne and the AFL? Uh, the Adelaide Football Club, what recourse do you reckon we have against the AFL? Um, you know, there's some fairly serious ramifications to that because that's essentially a cover-up that resulted mm. in in sanctions to... Uh, Dean that that uh, had a direct impact on on the Crows, and sanctions to Dean himself in terms of his own uh, mental health and well being. Donkey, you're going to get binned in a minute. Um, you know, it, this isn't something that can just be swept under the carpet. That's a major cover up. 
Well, well, it, well, it was a, 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 a an incredible cover up. I mean, it's, as I said before, it's an astonishing story because, you know, the AFL. Um, I mean, I read an article through the week about you know the you know the reasoning, the, the likely reasoning behind it, and that is you know basically that um, you know the potential. Uh, the, or the fact that Melbourne were, you know, pretty heavily lawyered up, and um, you know the, the money that it was going to cost, and you know the, the problem, the, the problems that they had, and all these kind of sort of extraneous excuses around it, why the AFL sort of tried to uh, to massage the whole the whole issue, but all it's done is is expose them to just. They, I mean, they're just it's just terrible, you know. It's, they just um, they, they they've just got no, no whatsoever. Well, it's also no very arrogant. Um, Pete, I reckon that they just feel like, yeah, oh, you know, give it enough time, and then we can come out with a bit, and you know, people will just shake their fingers at us, and and life will go on. It's extremely arrogant, and it, like mm. the the competition is so manipulated and so controlled by head office, um, and you know, it will. the The problem is, it will just get swept under the carpet. There'll be a little bit of media for mm. a while, um, and then it'll go away, and. Meanwhile, as I mentioned, and as you said, there's people and clubs and teams that were directly impacted. We, the loss of Bailey for those uh, for that period of time was a massive loss for the LA Crows. Huge. Mm. You know, and and the the thing for me about this is, it it was kind of known at the time. Everybody talked about it, but there was no proof. But we all kind of knew that it it, it came from the top. And it had to have come from the top, um, that direction, and that's where the club wanted to go. And what this raises for me is what's what does the AFL have around Essendon that they really don't want to get out? Oh, look, it's undoubtedly a whole dossier of of communication and cover-ups and all the rest. I mean, let's not forget that Demetrio was in charge back then. He was the master manipulator. He makes Gillan McLaughlin look like a, a bloody infant in terms of his ability to manipulate the competition and manipulate the way he wants things done. And, um, you know, uh, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if there's a massive file deep down in the archives of someone's basement um, that will see the light of day in about 15, 20 years Um that will show that there's, the AFL There's a reason were, Adrian were, Anderson ran away very fast. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Anyway, what else we got, Pete? Oh, I thought that was a, that was a pretty good one. Um, oh, there was the – sorry, just going back to the um, – to the tribunal because that's always such a good source of fun for us, the, uh, the Jesse Hogan fine. I mean, that was, I mean, just crazy stuff. I mean, what's going on there, really? Did you see it? No, I didn't see it, Pete. Feel no, I haven't seen that one, Pete. Oh, jeez. So what two, guys going for the, two guys going for the ball and it just kind of, they kind of just bumped into each other and it was, you know, on the wing and it was just nothing. You know, and, and Hogan, because Hogan was first there at the ball, he, he's, he's, getting, he's got done for you know, rough conduct, $2,000, two or $3,000 fine or something. You know, and the, and they just and they, like nothing. I mean, the other it wasn't like the other guy was even remotely hurt. They just kept, he just kept playing the ball. Yeah, so not, two guys going for the ball. Not unlike the uh, the one last week. Who was that? Um, was it Sicily last week? Oh my god! I don't know what's going on with this game. I really don't. Well, it's yeah, just it, so inconsistent. But, uh, also, I think it raises a bit of a problem with all this sliding in uh, rules and the head first contact. You're not, you know, a golden order of footy you're taught from, you know, under eights and above. Uh, is that you go in, you go in hard and you go in head first, and you, well, not just head first, but you go in hard and you go in early for the ball, and uh, you get protected if that happens. Whereas now, if you if you're first to the ball, you're almost penalised because if you're first and you hit legs or hit some of those other things, you're, um, you know, you're not seen as having a correct duty of care. I think they need to work on how they uh, write those rules and interpret them because there's just there's no incentive to play the game the right way anymore. Well, the thing is um, that the rule was subtly changed because when it was first brought in for Gary Rowan, after the Gary Rowan thing, it was a slide-in rule. You couldn't slide in. And then it changed to contact below the knees. And yeah. that's where the whole thing changed, Donkey, as you, as you rightly mentioned. You know, it, it, 
actively stops blokes from going. We highlighted one a couple of weeks ago where Chase Jones got a free kick paid against oh, him. I was gonna, the guy didn't even bloody Chase, touch him. The Chase Jones jump was amazing. Like he's reached out on his hands and knees, grabbed the football, someone's come through to kick it, and he's got a free kick against him. I mean, that's well, ridiculous. The, the Hawthorne like, guy actually didn't make con- uh, like Chase didn't actually make contact with the Hawthorne guy. The Hawthorne guy let his foot slide into Chase and fell forward. But Chase at no stage actually made contact with him. He had two hands on the ball. I mean, it's yeah. just an absolutely ridiculous rule. And again, it's another example, as you rightly say, Donk, where the AFL are changing the fabric of the game. I'm just Monica, looking at, no, uh, for me, um, just quickly on this, Pete, they've, as you were talking about, the, the head on contact. Now, we actually have a rule that says that players who try to instigate contact, so if they've got their head over the ball, if they're the ones who then drive the head forward, they get a free paid against them because they're actually instigating that contact. They're That's creating right. the dangerous situation. That's right. So the AFL can do that. So we now have players, and there was like in the, the – I'm pretty sure it was in the West Coast um, Collingwood game, which was a great game, um, that one of the, the – the Collingwood player who went for the ball, the West Coast player just – a kind of came in with his legs and dove over the top so he could get the free. Now, he's actually – that player has put himself in a position of injury, same as with the driving the head forward. I think they actually need to fix their freaking bloody rules and interpretation and actually say if you come in as a player with no intention of getting that ball, that you're just going to – because if it's just – your legs are going over the top. You're not going to try and get the ball. Your hands are not down at all. You've caused that particular contact to happen. Therefore, the free should be against you. They've got a rule that will penalise players for trying to cause an injury to themselves. And they've got a rule that's actually encouraging players to try and get an injury for themselves because they get a free kick out of it. Yep. Um just, I'm just looking at. Sorry, I'm just looking at the video footage of this one for Jesse Hogan. So it's a loose ball. And Hogan and the St Kilda player, they they're running towards the ball. They're not crouched down or anything. They're just sort of running in stride. They see each other, and they brace for each other's contact. There's some sort of slight sort of contact ish. Hogan, as a result of the contact, Hogan actually runs over the ball. The St Kilda player kind of gives him a bit of a shove, so he is well and truly out of the picture. So the Kilda player picks up the ball, handballs, and get and the player goes back on to St Kilda's favour. Somehow, out of that, Hogan has a three thousand dollar fine, down to two thousand with an early plea for rough conduct. I mean, it is astonishing. Yeah, just the uh, most ridiculous decision that I've ever seen. Was there an explanation from the from the MRP? Not that, not that I've read, Fane. Not that I've read. Just just rough conduct. Yeah. Yeah, last I looked, we were playing a contact sport, weren't we? Yeah. This is this is terrible. I mean, how how can you not have rough contact? Uh, rough conduct in a in a contact sport is kind of part of the game, isn't it? It's supposed to be rough. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what, I think what we're really seeing is um, uh, a policy reaction to uh, uh, the problem of concussions and and the things that are going on. And so what we're seeing is an overzealous and inappropriate response to those problems that are actually occurring. And those the overcorrections are probably making more problems within the game than they than they intended because they haven't been thought through. If you don't think through the solution, you get a worse you get a worse outcome from your policy response. And don't you know, we were um, talking about this last week and the problem with that is that it's inconsistent. Well yeah, because it's 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 inconsistent because there's no uh, there's no value behind it. Mm. What, what's the thing they're trying to make better by doing? Um, and the thing they're trying to make better is to, uh, when they're in court to talk about concussion in you know six months' time, they want to be able to say these are all the changes they've made to make the competition better, um, rather than rather than actually look at what's going to reduce the impact and and uh, What's needed to be done? They want to see. They want to, it's the AFL wanting to be seen to be doing things rather than doing the right thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now, Mackie, you're back in, mate. So uh, feel free to speak. Uh, and if uh, it happens again, you're you're out. You're in sin bin. 
Oh, he's gone. Just a little Sorry, snippet, to, little snippet for the tipsters out there. That um, just a little bit of an odd statistic that um, in 15 matches um, that Buddy Franklin for Hawthorne of Sydney has played against the D's, Buddy Franklin is currently 15 zip on the D's. So wow. uh, there's one for the tipsters uh, if you're looking at the Sydney and Melbourne game uh, on the weekend. Well, Bit could, of an odd statistic, that one. You, you, yeah, um, you, you couldn't pick Melbourne anyway at the moment, could you? They're bloody terrible. God, no. Uh, they were better and, when they were tanking. <laughs> At least they're predictable. I think, <laughs> I, I think some of the midfielders are currently tanking. Oh, um, just on some AFLW news, because there's the trade period, which is up and going at the moment. So we did have Chelsea Randall at the Club Champion Awards on Friday night actually announce um, that she's committed to the club for next season. So bye-bye, West Coast. You can't have her. Um, but it is only the one-year deal. Katie Brennan, though, is the big news today because she, their captain of the Western Bulldogs, has left to go to Richmond, who have given her a two-year deal. So that's wow. the new thing uh, this year is they can now have uh, two-year deals. But interesting, Richmond have gone for a very tall, slowish. Well, Katie Brennan's not that slow. I actually do really like her as a player. Um, but with Sabrina Frederick, Torb is also quite heavily rumoured to be um, – announced to also be going to Richmond. So they're actually getting a lot taller forward line, which is complete contrast to the team that dominated this year and us, which didn't have those those big tall forwards. Um, there's been a few other little movements uh, and stuff around and apparently West Coast are working very hard to take at least all the eight players they're allowed to from Fremantle. So uh, I, and by the sounds of it, we're going to, do quite well at keeping our squad together, um, which and all the other teams are going to get weaker. I don't think it's going to be that good a look for the AFLW next year. What um, for uh, for me that hasn't been paying much attention to this part of the AFLW, Nikki? What who are the expansion teams next year? So we've got four. Uh, yeah. We've got Gold Coast, uh, Richmond, St Kilda, and uh, West Coast. Interesting. Gold Coast is interesting. I, I think yeah, this is a well, real danger well, season. The a- Queensland actually has a, a huge growth um, in participation and their under-18 uh, girls teams has actually been performing better than the Vic Country teams over the past two years. So they're actually very strong up there. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. I, I, I do think Brisbane actually, unfortunately, need to move on Sarsovic because he's kind of stuck in the older game plan. Um, West Coast have been working quite hard for um, a couple of years um, and, and developing players and actually keeping them out of Fremantle's team as well. Um, I, I think that's kind of been the rumour that some girls have not nominated for the draft when they've kind of been eligible because they, they know they're going to get... Um, uh, picked up there. Um, but uh, St Kilda, we haven't heard anything about any signings from them yet, but Richmond, uh, they've got the nice big splashy news today. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's close up the news on that one. Uh, American Crow, uh, welcome in the chat. There's no way in a pink fit I'm talking about the Cleveland Browns. Thanks very much. Or <laughs> the Cleveland Cavaliers or the Cleveland, whoever the hell other team you've got there, some... Ice hockey team, right. I don't know what the hell's going on. Um, Come but, on down to Brown Town theme. Come on. No, 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 no. Let's get into some match talk, shall we? I have to do that really quick because YouTube got me in trouble again last week. Anyway, match talk. We suck. Discuss. In both yep. teams. Yep. And we where's, suck in exactly the same ways. Where's Pete gone? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, um, yeah I, I actually I had a um I had a good look at the twos on um on Friday night. Dude, that was pretty bad. Um, <laughs> so there's not a lot of uh... it, it was kind of okay for the first half. It wasn't too bad, but the second half and that last quarter when was atrocious. Yeah. Yeah, there's not a lot of joy there. Um but no, look I went to the game on, on Thursday night. And what, what 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 was everyone's general thoughts? Well, you go. Oh, yeah. We had a big say, so you and Donkey have a have a crack. Well, I thought there there was um, 
you know, there was some reasonable, I thought there was some reasonable positives. I mean, there were some reasonable positives in terms of um, some of the, um, some of the ball move was actually pretty good. Um, I thought coming out of defense, it wasn't, wasn't too bad, N- not all night, but on, on occasion, but then they just hit a, they hit a roadblock, didn't they? Around about the middle. There was just nothing, nothing at all. And, and the amount of times we saw the ball run out, you know, reasonably well and reasonably fluently. And then it just, it just stopped at around about the halfway point. And um, it was pretty horrific after that. Yeah, so well, we, the only thing, the, I mean, the only thing that was really disappointing for me on the night was the fact that I was two points off the margin. I was well, one. Yeah, the way I see it, Pete, is that um, I thought we moved the ball. Uh, I, obviously, that we've got a very slow back line on our last line uh, with, the, with the tools there. And our real weapons for attacking come from our half back line, which is, uh, we're led, which is, is getting very heavily tagged, uh, Smith and Miller, and that's where any pace comes from. And um, what they what the happened on with the Geelong game is what happened in the Hawthorne game. Uh, slow us down coming out of defence because um, our midfielders were going pretty well, uh, but uh, the way it was coming out of defence. It, it, there were occasions when we managed to get some speed coming and pace coming out of there. And when we could actually, uh, Geelong didn't get time to get into that roadblock position, which the, they they do. Uh, but most of the time we would get the ball, then we would look up and our forwards weren't spreading. They weren't leading. And, and, uh, and fortunately, Taylor Walker, who didn't have a really great game, he led a lot of times and was ignored. Um, we don't have players that can clunk a mark, and um, we, yeah, we kept uh, bombing into the forward line, and uh, and Geelong just picked us off with, with ease because some of their players can actually take a mark, and ours can't. Jenkins was back to being Jenkins of old. Um, at the moment, I was so pissed off with Jenkins because uh, you take for example that one on the half forward flank where he he got the ball if he'd moved it on quickly, he had two players free ahead of him and he had, for some reason he bought turned around and then turned it a look away handball to the boundary line missing totally missing the play and uh our forwards i don't believe are in, in the right spot uh they're not leading they're not leading away from each other they're leading towards each other um and uh, if they do lead or they're, or they're hanging behind um i don't know i don't know if, disposal coming in there is not all that good having said everything i've just said we still could have won the game if we kick straight so um if we ever get our game plan in correct if we ever get some cohesion going perhaps we might start winning a lot of games but um we are our own worst enemy at the moment i have to give some credit to geelong in their midfield setup because they exploited matt crouch beautifully because we know he doesn't defensively run and they made sure of who they could get on him and then they could actually exploit it so that his player whoever he was supposed to be mining was the one who would then get off the chain um brad was also a little bit slack at times in that respect but but matt was completely completely useless as being able to do that two-way running and that's unfortunately the one downside with Matt because he doesn't have the speed but he's never really had that desire to do that defensive run and he has to do it um because they they know about him now and they exploited that brilliantly the other thing is that where we got those where Geelong got those run-ons it was once again it was a small forwards and it was everybody else pointing fingers at everybody else that you need to man up on him. So as much as we love that run we can get from half back, but Laird, who's being heavily tagged, and he's also playing shit, he's not defending well. When we know he can actually defend, but he's not even doing that. Like His confidence is, is shot because of that. Smithers can defend a bit, but he wasn't really doing anything at all in that game. He was kind of getting his run on, but he wasn't then running back once the ball got turned over, which, as you guys just pointed out, it did a lot. And Miller was kind of non-existent a little bit. Um, 
Although he wasn't too bad when he was manned up on um, Ablett. I thought that was actually a, a decent matchup because he, he has that speed to counter the wiliness of, of Ablett. Um, but, yeah, they, they weren't doing their natural switchovers that we've seen them do in the past, that they knew that whoever was in the position, they could take that forward coming through and they would do a, a, a decent job. But the one thing that really kind of got to to me and my my dad pointed it out um was the way we bring the ball out of defense it's exactly the same as how we bring it in in the twos as we do it in the afl side and it is so freaking predictable and it's why that ball keeps pinging back in because we kick it out to the pocket and then we go straight up the fat side up the wing where there's a huge contest we never ever bring it into the center well it didn't seem to didn't seem to didn't seem to matter for Geelong, Nikki. Oh no, they could do it. No, 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 no. No, you obviously didn't watch the game because Geelong every there. I don't care, every kick out, Geelong went short to the pocket and down the fat side. They never, ever went through the corridor. In fact, their whole tra- their whole doing, transition they hang on, through the fat side. Hang on. They were They're, isolating players. Hang on. Their whole transition was based around us guarding the corridor and them just going down the line. It, there was there was a key difference in the way that they would defend as that, as we were coming out. When we were coming out of defence, we were coming out wide as we always do, and they would station three players or, or four players in a row uh, horizontally, so across the ground, about twenty to twenty five metres in front of the kicker. Right, and what yep. that was doing was forcing us to either kick long and high, or to go, or to try and switch slowly, and and they would just shuffle across and shuffle across. We, when we were guarding them coming out of defence, what we were doing was set was blocking the corridor, which meant that they were actually able to get outnumbered situations down the line because we actually had too many players in the corridor half the time out of position and not even in the play, like, you know, 100 metres away from the ball. And they were at, there were so many times where they could just kick it down the line to a contest knowing that they had one or two out numbers because we were sitting there waiting for them to try and cut into the middle and they, and they refused to do it all night, Nikki. Yeah, but, but, that, but that's, that's what I was actually... That's my point I made at the start is that teams know how to counter it because we're doing that. They then can set up and cover it so that they can get that. And we're stupid enough. We're not smartly coached at the moment. So as much as Matt has been great in the SNFL, he's not doing a good job with that back line in terms of um, all the team defense, whoever is in charge of that. You, you just make my point for me, Phoenix. That's, uh, there was, that's a, exactly there was a, what I meant. There was more than a few times where I saw the ball fluently run out of defense and 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 up the center corridor and then and then what was going what what happened on a few occasions was because there was just nothing literally nothing yeah because they're all too high up to go to that they ended up switching switching wide because you know the run through the corridor it just it just stops in its tracks yeah but they really three five and sloan in particular he had got it right in the center of the ground and then went uh out about a 60 degree angle out to the half forward flank, which I think ended up going out of bounds. So, um, your, your point three well made, Pete. When, when we and broke and out of the, when they sorry, go on, Pete. sorry, go on. no, go, on, mate. Oh, I was just going to quickly say, just the amount of times I saw the ball, you know, go into the um, in, into the uh, to the hot zone just above the goal square, you know, with Lockie Murphy just there by himself. Well, you know, to contest, I mean, it was just ridiculous. It, it was or stupid, or stupid. Their other Ruckman. Stupid, yeah. or even Menangola was dropping back as well. Um, what was happening on on our transition, Pete, you're right, we would start down the corridor and then we'd flick it out wide and then we'd end up entering the forward 50 either having to kick deep or kicking to a lead that was easily covered by Geelong and often it was a two-on-one situation, either Tex or whoever, you know, right out on the boundary at the 50. Um, and to me, a lot of that comes down to one bloke, and that's Josh Jenkins, because whenever he was played up high, unlike the Josh of old who would get on his bike and run back in to cover that space on transition, he was nowhere. Mm. We were playing right. Tex yep. high and, and JJ deep, 
and every time we played Tex High and JJ and uh, Tex Deep and JJ High, he was nowhere to be seen. I, I was very annoyed with his game. I just thought he, he fell back into his old habits. He, he, last year he was one of our better players, but this year, uh, on what he's shown so far this year, as I said, I'd trade him at the end of the year. Mm. I, I, Donkey, there's a, there's another thing that I've watched in I. Uh, and admittedly, I've been watching on dodgy Wi-Fi or on iPhones while on tubes. So it hasn't been always the best viewing. But the, the thing that's really stuck out to me is I really feel that our skills are quite down um, whenever, whenever I've noticed this play. And, you know, it's really hard to e extrapolate the structure and how well we're executing it if we're not actually hitting our targets with our kicks. Um, you know, the amount of times we put the ball two metres over Texas' head or two metres in front of him and he's, you know, getting it on the bounce and... All those uh, execution delivery things, I think, are, are probably causing us a few more problems than um, than we're that we're attributing to structure when it's actually just our execution delivery. And I think in, until we clean that up, we're not going to be moving anywhere. We'll crunch out some wins and grind out some wins, but if our skills stay at this level, we're in a, we're going to be in a world of pain. Well, Donk, you're right. And what what is one of the big factors in terms of impacting uh, skills and, and causing skill errors? What would you say one of the big factors is? Too much fun at training. <laughs> no, seriously. Opposition pressure. Well, that's one. Oh, no. But what, what's another? No concentration, no focus. No, it, it's fatigue. Players oh, get no, tired. I'm talking start, start of the match, they're doing it, mate. Yeah, no, no. But what I'm saying is that it's, it's not just game day fatigue. One thing that I noticed when I was running through the video for Sunday night is we look very, very heavy in the legs, very slow, very one pace. There's not a lot of acceleration from any of our players and it makes me wonder whether they've been smashed at training early on and, and they're just uh, uh, needing a bit of a taper because at the moment it seems to me they're getting tired and they're not running and their skills are breaking down under pressure and, and in those fatigue situations. Well, oh, I agree with you. We, as a group, we look slower than, the other, than our opposition does. But is that because we are slow, though? Oh, maybe, the fact, maybe. Because you have a look. If you go through our players and uh, name the ones that have got speed above the average, I don't think you you, you wouldn't get a handful. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, you, oh, you would, but they're not play. They're not being played in positions that are going to hurt the opposition. We, you know, Miller and, and Smithers off half back. They they could probably hurt, but you got Chase Jones who's being played as a defensive forward. You got Rory Atkins yep. who's is fast enough, but that doesn't get near it, so it doesn't matter. Um, sure. Yep, you've got uh, Seedsman has a reasonable amount of pace. Uh, not there. Who not else have we got? Well, obviously. But I, see, we, I think we're just about out of them already. Well, yeah, well, you you're definitely right. You're definitely right. Our, our midfield, our main rotation is Matt Crouch, Brad Crouch, and Rory Sloan, and Bryce They're Gibbs. Not quite. Uh, who's going to who's going to break? And to add to your point, Pete, and I don't know whether you saw the Sunday night cast, but Brad Crouch um, at the moment, oh Nikki, it was you that was making the point about the midfield. He's not a midfield's asshole at the moment, and I don't care whether he got no. 29 touches or whatever. His first quarter was atrocious. Yeah, he's not making good decisions in who he's giving it to. Um, he's not even Hoy's making decisions. A, yeah, Hori's made a very interesting point because in the chat we've actually been discussing about the, the fun, etc. that we saw that that same kind of messaging came through for the women's team and the men's, and yet look how the women's performed. But he actually pointed out Matthew Clark's acceptance speech where he talked about that that group is the most united group he's ever been a part of that those women are and it's a and he's point said so that's actually quite a pointed comment from clark here because that's not the men that's the women who are that yeah, so obviously there's some disconnect going on no that it, the men could be second most i mean i don't think there's anything in that i think he was just commenting but on I the women more than commenting on the men I don't, dis I, I don't disagree with the Brad Crouch comment, Fain. I, you know, I, I've thought for for a long time that he, um, the re his reputation sort of far exceeds a lot of the time. You know what we actually see from Brad when, when we actually see anything at all if he's actually out there. 
Well, there was um, so yeah. There was one key one that we highlighted on Sunday night, Pete, where um, uh, Sloney started on danger. So if you can picture it, uh, Sloney's starting on the defensive side for them. Uh, sorry, on the defense mm. on the attacking side for us. On danger, who's on the defensive side for them? Brad Crouch is on the defensive side for us. Uh, and then you've got Matt Crouch in there as well. So Sloan and Danger run under the under the contest. They they get the the knock, but Sloan manages to get Danger under the contest. So the he then has Sloan then turns around to chase the ball. In the meantime, um, I forget the guy's name. Matt Crouch's opponent runs through and gets the ball. But the critical thing was that Danger, having been pushed under the ball. He's, he ran forward. Now, the bloke that was covering that movement was Brad Crouch. He was by himself on the defensive side of that contest. So Dangerfield had to basically run past Brad Crouch in order to to uh, make position on the half-forward flank to get the eventual pass from Ablett, right? Now, Brad Crouch was nowhere near Dangerfield. In fact, Rory mm. Sloan, who had to turn around and chase him, got closer to Dangerfield than Crouch did. Crouch should have blocked Dangerfield on the way through. Brad wasn't e- didn't even have a player on him because they had one loose on and we had one loose on either side of the contest. Brad being on the defensive side, as soon as Danger started running forward, having been pushed under the ruck contest, Brad should have at the very least picked him up and at the most put a block on him. And yeah. Dangerfield ended up 20 metres clear. 20 metres clear. And then, then the other one that we highlighted, Brad Crouch actually started on Dangerfield at the, at the bounce. Dangerfield was behind Crouchy. Crouchy had body on him. The ball goes up. The ball gets tapped down. Crouch basically stands and watches while Dangerfield goes and gets the ball. He doesn't move. Actually doesn't move. Is that the one where Rob ended up chasing him? Uh, no, it's the one where um, Danger got the got the spill out of the congestion and then handballed it over to their number eleven who ran through. Um, but the funny thing was that Brad stayed stock still and ended up being not even even if we'd have got the ball out of that spillage, Brad wasn't in a position to get it. So he just basically stood there and ball watched after having body on Dangerfield up until the moment that the ruckman tapped the ball. It was it was unbelievable. If anyone hasn't watched it yet, go back and watch about 20, 25 minutes in on the video that we showed on Sunday night and watch those two Brad Crouch midfield uh, performances and you'll be shocked that an elite AFL midfielder can make two fundamental errors against one of the game's elite midfielders. And that's that's well, again, that's what that's indicative of how we're playing at the moment. And it just goes a little bit deeper than just that. It... Um, when Kelly was in the middle, uh, Kelly was playing as the outside mid, and every time the ball got tapped down, all our people would dive would dive in for the ball. Yeah, and he'd just and run forward. There's Kelly sitting on there waiting for the ball to come out, and off he'd go. Yep. And uh, really, our structure at the midfield really needs. So actually, we, we at the moment we've criticised our forward coach, our defensive coach, and the mid. Midfield coach. Well, I, th- I think the defensive coach is all right. I think it's actually the bloody selection d- down back that got us, because as Cam and I were talking about on the rev up on uh, Thursday before the game, they had they had four smalls and we didn't we like who was our smallest player? We had Miller uh, there, but we had Jake Kelly playing in Luke Brown's spot. We had Keith Hardigan and Talia as the three tools, and then Smith and, and Miller. I, it was a complete stuff-up by the selection panel in terms of getting those matchups right. Yeah, look, I thought Kelly was really showing up uh, on the weekend. Uh, they did play smalls up there, and uh, Kelly had real real trouble keeping up. I, I thought he he didn't look like an AFL player when he's standing on players that are quick and small. Well, the, 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 I mean, probably a good, a good time to just... You know, raise a point that it it dovetails into the, the this issue that we we're, we're just so wedded to continuity as a philosophy mm. that we just we do not we do not have any kind of flexibility or any kind of creativity um, in terms of you know matchups or that we 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 just 
110% wedded to continuity as being, you know, the, um, the, the, the panacea to everything. Well, it's just, you know, it's just mind-boggling. Have a look at uh, who'd be sitting down at selection on a Thursday night, um, Pete. Because uh, whoever's done it has manufactured it really well. You've got Don Pike, you've got Scott Camperiali, who we know is one of the main wedded to continuity guys. You've got Matty Clark, who's also a rusted on assistant. And then our midfield coach is Gordon, and our defensive coach is um, Matna, and our forward coach is Ben Hart. Three guys who aren't going to say a freaking word. Two of them mm. are rookie coaches straight from the SANFL. What are, what other club in the AFL has got two rookie assistant coaches from a lower league? And then we've got Ben mm. Hart, who no one's really paying any attention to anyway because no one wanted him in, on the coaching panel in the first place. <laughs> no, but it's true, yeah. Macca. So it's when true. you actually think about what the dynamic would be like at selection, it would be a discussion between Don Pike, Scott Camprioli, and Matt, and probably a bit of Matt Clark. The other three wouldn't have a yeah. bit to say. So what are you going to get out of that? You're going to get the yeah. same old shit every time because there's no tension at selection. There's no challenging. There's no uh, ideas. You know, you know, I'm not putting Marty Matner or Mick Godden down, but they're three games into their first year of an AFL coaching career. They're not going to sit down and stand up to Scott Camprioli, who's the senior assistant. No. Yeah, that's it's that's light years away from when we had uh, Teague and Podziardley as our assistant coaches. Um, Definitely. And unfortunately, that's showing uh, on the field uh, in selection. It's showing in uh, the way they play. Um, you're quite right. Then we've got we, some players just rusted on into that team. As well, that was Macca gone. Thanks, Macca. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. That's... Uh, putting all that aside and, and just put giving some kind of positivity to it, um, you know, at the end of the day, with all of the, uh, uh, you know, I mean, with how bad we were on Thursday night, you know, early in the last quarter, we've got to kick to tie the scores. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, and so there was, you know, as I said at the, at the very, very start, I, I thought that there were some good signs with our, I actually thought there were some good signs with our run out of defence. Um, Agreed. And there was hey. certainly, sorry? I agree. And there was some, um, and the third quarter was excellent. And, you know, interestingly enough with the third quarter is that people, it, it gets, when his form is as bad as what it is at the moment, it's very, very easy um, to lose sight of the fact of just how important Tex is to our side. Now, he he came, you know, a little bit to life in the third quarter, did a couple of things. He got his hand on the ball a bit. He kicked a goal. When when Walker is able to inject himself into the game, it just lifts the whole side. I mean, you cannot downplay how important that man is, and it's just it's a you know it's a bit of a tragedy for the side at the moment that um, th that he's playing like he, he is. But you can't you can't you know you can't deny how important he is. You can't deny what he does to the side. And in that third quarter, you know, um, Tex is up and about. And he's doing a few things, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, we're a different side. And no. and you know, we, we we're every chance. We're every I disagree. Chance. I disagree, Pete, so much. I disagree because there was one key we thing. There was one key thing that changed in the third quarter that made us get back into the game, and that was that we stopped kicking it to thirty meters out, and we started spotting up at forty-five. That was oh, the, look, that was I'm, the key sorry, difference. I disagree with that. Yeah, I know. I wouldn't disagree with that. And I, I, look, I'm not, don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm certainly not saying that he, that Tex was, you know, the the be all and end all. And and I'm sure that there were things that we changed. And I, I absolutely wouldn't disagree with that, mate. Not, not at all. I was just sort of I saying that you know when and and he wasn't at, even in the third quarter he wasn't at his best at all. But just when he oh now Pete's gone. Oh, we lost Pete. <laughs> So it's just you, me, and Donkey? Uh-oh. <laughs> no, well, I'm here, I oh, think. Oh, Macca's back. <laughs> yeah, I'll go. you back? Yeah, you still there, Macca. No, I don't know what's happened to Injects Pete. himself into the game. It does feel that, you know, um, sorry, are you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, sorry. So, I don't, I look, I don't doubt there's a whole lot of stuff that <laughs> impact upon that third quarter. Um, but, yeah, Tex is just, when he does get his hands on the ball, it does, you know, it lifts the crowd, it lifts the team. And, uh, but, um, Anyway, we're, so we're, 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 you know, we're a kick away 
from tying the game up. And then, of course, we, you know, we, Gary Ablett puts in, you know, 10 minutes of Gary Ablett and, uh, um, and Chuck. Um, where do we end up from there? We'll look at, you know, you'd look at the fixture and, and think well, there's no reason if we can't, you know, get a bit of form, we could run ourselves a bit better. Yeah, maybe Peter, and, uh, and save a season. But that's, Peter, looking, you, that's, that's giving a positive view. Peter, you're oh. starting to break up now. Don? Oh, I, it, as, as Pete uh, was swing up to the positivity, I'll, I'll take over the mantle and run it hard in that direction. I, you know, three games in, I don't think we need to throw all the babies out with all the bathwater. I think there's been enough good play and enough few things about what we've done in the first three rounds to to just see the glimmers of things that could be if we can if we can get things right. Um, I, I I do think that the skills problem that we had is a huge thing going forward, and I think that Fiend might be on the money here with with some bit of overtraining because we've heard all about how they were. Uh, running very hard and heavy all pre-season. So if they've overtrained a bit and they're a bit heavy in the legs uh, and then uh, it means it's impacted our skills, then I think that's not a bad thing. The other thing is we've probably had three of the toughest games of our fixture uh, in the first three rounds of this year. You know, we haven't probably done what we needed to do. But um, uh, but after after those first three rounds, our, our, our um, fixture does lighten up a fair way. Um, so look, if we can, if we can run out a bit of form against North Melbourne, uh, not that that's been easy over the last few years, but we can run out some form against North Melbourne then, um, and get some continuity into the, the guys and get some, um, good play. Then I don't think, I don't think it all is lost. I just think, uh, I think we're having a bit of a wobble at the start and, uh, into repurposed an old, um, repurposed an old keating phrasing now that we're in election season. Uh, this was, these were the losses we had to have. So. Uh, I think it's good timing. Extremely well, disappointed imagine, in both of yeah, you. Go well, on, I'm with, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with you, Pete. I'm disappointed because I, I was going to say, Donkey made some very good points there, but it still doesn't alter the fact that the two teams that beat us, and they are very good teams, but we're not arguing about that, um, they did it in a certain manner, and it is a formula that will, it's going to beat us every time unless we we play a little bit differently. Um, uh and I've seen written in many, many times in many places this week that that both Hawthorne and Geelong have shown the formula how to beat the Crows, and I think that's true. Um, some teams won't be able to do that because they won't have the quality of players uh, to be able to do it. But for teams that perhaps we should beat in marginal games, it could be the difference between winning and losing. And so um, I think, yes, we can, win the, we can win the next four games, but we also need to have... Uh, a better structure. We need to have uh, a better formula up forward, and uh, and I think our coaches have to perhaps make a few changes that they don't want to make uh, because they seem reluctant to make the changes and introduce a, at least a couple of young buds in there with it. like young Shoal in the back lines could easily be introduced instead of Kelly. Uh, his form has been excellent, and he he looks like a real player of the future. I think um, so. I think, you know, bringing in a couple of young boys and uh, uh, play and just correct the problems that we've got that, that if people like us can see it, well, surely they must be aware of it. You'd hope they would be aware of them anyhow. So, what do you think, Nikki? Yes, we can improve. I think after watching the game on Friday night, the SNFL, um, I think Shoal is very close, should be very close to getting a call up. The only problem is we love those three players across the half back line. Um, well, Miller but should probably go into the middle. Yeah, and and that's what I think you can do with him. Um, I know that um, Vardy Magic actually asked me a question on Twitter about you know is he actually quick, quick because that wasn't something we we'd seen with him. And the obs- the observation I have is he's he's quick, but he's not like super speedy. But what he can do is he can maintain that speed. For a, so he gets the break on the opponent and then he can maintain that break. Um, he times his runs beautifully. Uh, he's got such a really good kick. The only downside was, um, I said it in the chat, that Himmelberg couldn't catch a beach ball um, on uh, on Friday night. Uh, but there was also a bit of problems with some of the delivery to him was like the delivery that we've been doing to the uh, AFL team. Shit. Um 
Gooch got into it a little bit, so it was nice to uh, – I think he's one we will see back in the team soon and he will inject that midfield pace because yes. what I've heard We've is – got to put him back in. That yeah, Pike's been back in. very, very keen to get him into the midfield. Um, and But I, the, the player who I was most impressed with was actually Paholke. He's taken a really nice step forward. Um and whilst, unfortunately, he's not that quick player, he can actually take a contested mark. Where do you play um, him? Where do you play him, Nick? He's, he, yeah, and he's a midfielder. And we're not going to, unfortunately, we're not going to take out those players, the Crouchers or Sloan or Gibbs, and that's the problem. Mm. Yeah. Glitch is the man. Yeah, he he, he has agree. to come in. I agree. He has to come in and he has to be played in the midfield rotation, the not midfield. as a hard, hard forward. Um, no, yeah. I, I, I think he will come in the midfield, fingers crossed, if they do it properly. I, I saw some good signs from Gallucci and Nick, you would have um, you would have seen his dash uh, down the wing and he's hit Himmelberg on the chest with an absolute bullet and then yeah. followed up and Himmelberg's given the dish and, he, and, he's, and Gallucci's kept going. It was classic Jordan Gallucci. And it was and you know a what? bullet pass. Wasn't it? It was magnificent. Now... It was um, like, I'm sorry, you shouldn't be able to run at the speed of the ball. It Almost. should have actually put a hole. It should have put a hole in Elliot. <laughs> it, should, it should have gone straight through it. <laughs> but I, I'll say this, and Nick, you know this. He's ne- Gallucci's never, ever been a big performer in the sample, and I don't yeah. know why that is. He's never, ever, you know, d- um, but he just does things you think, yep, that belongs at a higher level. Yeah. And, um, and And we've lost Pete again. I reckon he makes a trend. Um, I should, it's, it's my, but I'd say it's probably my Wi-Fi. Yeah. Am I, do you... No. Sorry, Pete. You're gone. I'll stop. I'll stop. Um, <laughs> look, um, I, I agree one, with, Pete, with Gooch. Pete's, yeah, Pete, Pete's other favourite in Ben Davis. Um, he, it's been really nice to see his development that he's been doing. And um, I know you've been quite hard on Lynch, Fane. Um, I did like the start of the game because it looked like he'd had some angry pills and he was working really hard to get into the game, Lynch that is, but then he faded. Um, but Davis was doing some very nice things in the SNFL. But, yeah, we just absolutely got pollaxed in the last quarter. It was almost a mirror image of the AFL game. Yeah. Fane, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, mate. I've, that was my Wi-Fi that's a bit dodgy, so I've just switched switched over. So, look, I was just going to quickly say that I put it, I put it on social media today. I, I just cannot understand, you know, we're two years into Jordan Gallucci's career and he's got 17 games up. If you look at guys that were drafted, you know, after him, you know, Pal Pepper, um, Berry, uh, Witherden, um, Haywood, all these guys have got, you know, 35, 40 games up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's a pick 15 midfielder and there's just no reason, no reason at all that he shouldn't be in our side and playing more games because he, he's shown plenty. When he's when he's got in, so um, you know when you think that we can we can get our you know old mate can get in and 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 play round one with, off the, off the back of no preseason <laughs> half a trial game, if yeah. old mate can do that, then you know why the hell are we you know worrying about pumping however many games into Galucci? Just get him in the side, get his pace in, get well, his I, creativity in. I think that's the key, uh, Pete. There are players that we just have to get into the side and and. Not that you ignore form, but I think you have to look at the dynamic of the team and probably set sail with a group for the next half a dozen weeks until the bye uh, and just see what that group can deliver. And I, we, We're too predictable, in my opinion. We're too easy to play against at the moment. Um, and, you know, there's probably... I mean, all those, all those changes, all those guys that you mentioned... I think Tyson Stengel is very stiff not to be uh, in the in the ones at the moment. I think Ned McHenry would have been the obvious replacement for Lukey Brown um, down back. Uh, I agree with you on Fogarty. I agree with you on Davis. I agree with you on Gallucci. Um, not sure about Greenwood because I just don't know where he fits at the moment. Um, but we could easily rejig our forward line to have Tex playing higher where he's looked half decent and have Fogg playing deeper with uh, Lynch out and Davis running around uh, creating a bit of havoc up forward and, and just just losing that sameness that we have up forward at the moment, um, mm-hmm. just injecting a little bit of unpredictability and, you know, having a marking forward, Pete, it just makes that opposition player more accountable 
Um, and at yes. the moment, they can sag off so easily because they know they've got two blokes to cover who can't really mark anyway. And if you watch Tex, every time the ball got kicked to him, he was two on one. So, yeah. But I am disappointed uh, that you blokes are all so optimistic because history will show you that we will smash this season out with the same game plan and the same working harder and smarter and getting better at the game plan. And we'll win our fair share because we've got a talented team. Uh, we're not a bad list, um, but we will get to finals in you know between five and eight and we'll get found out by the same teams that have worked out our game plan uh, and have done so consistently over the last couple of years. Richmond, Geelong, Hawthorne. And so oh, it's a pointless fucking exercise. I've tried to – look, I was really, really grumpy tonight. And if you've seen me on social media, I'm, I've been really, really grumpy in what I've posted. And, uh, you know, I, um, I'm – look, I'm, I'm trying to be a bit positive because I think that people probably don't want to, you know, get down too much. But, you know, honestly, if we're speaking the truth, I'm – genuinely, I'm done with this playing group. And I think, Fiend, you know that I've been done with this playing group for probably quite a while because I have seen – I've seen it happen too often. I've seen the same stuff. I've seen the same stuff in important games, and I just do not believe that this playing group has got any more left in it. Well, I think that's the and general. I, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the rest of you, but I think that's been the general feeling of this podcast for a good twelve months. Would that be yeah. a fair call? Yeah, yeah. I would say if you look at the, at the last twenty years since we uh, last won a flag. We, as a club, have had probably five opportunities in that time to win a flag, and we've managed to, by I think, by uh, a combination of coaching, game plan, and selection, managed to blow every one of them. And uh, it does you eventually do get a gutful of it. And I, at the moment, have no hope. I, I had hope at the beginning of this season, but when I saw we were just rolling out the same old stuff again, I thought to myself, well. You're right. We'll just blow, you're right, Fee. We'll just blow another season. We'll, we'll win a, yeah. a reasonable amount of games, but we won't do. We won't win a flag. I don't, I don't think so. And, and, and as uh, I said a couple of weeks ago, you know, the 2015 semi-final side, 15 players. Yeah. 15. And do you know how many? Do you have? In, do, sorry, just quickly. Do you know how many players in that Geelong side on Thursday night were playing in round 23, 2015? Five. Yeah. And that's the difference. And I was just about to say, Pete, and it follows on from your point perfectly, we could win a flag this year because we do have enough talent in our squad. But we've got to fucking play them, which means we've got to actually make some hard calls on some blokes. If we inject some yeah. youth and inject some enthusiasm and uh, some new fresh faces and get this game plan sorted out and actually make ourselves a little bit unpredictable and a little bit harder to play against... We've got enough talent on our list to be able to challenge any team in the competition. But mm. if but if the club keeps putting on the park the same players that we've been putting on the park, like you rightly point out, Pete, since 2015, with the same game plan that's been worked out by all the power clubs going around, then we won't. We don't have a chance of winning a flag. So my hope is that the Crows actually draw a line in the sand and start picking some blokes on form and picking a team that is more dynamic, uh, has more variety and can actually shake things up a bit. I agree. Yeah, absolutely agree. Absolutely. Anyway, fuck this. Let's do bloody competitions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I want to do the tipping. <laughs> Donkey, you prepared? I am prepared and ready to go. Welcome to the <laughs> Crowcast Dream Team 2019 Round 1 results. I know this is what everyone's been waiting for. I've been getting private messages going off the chain, just oh, people yeah. wanting to know how, what has been happening in Round 1 of the competitions. And people want to know, have has Phoenix finally got it together? Has he finally been able to assemble a list that's going to sail him up to the top of the ladder? And we have our answer, ladies and gentlemen. No. Is that answer? Uh, but he isn't bottom of the ladder, which is a good thing for him. So if we, Do have you know, a look I didn't at, change uh, my bloody team for the first three weeks because I forgot all about the fact that even though we couldn't see the scores, it was actually going. 
it, it's um well you're only been playing two years so you know the, yeah i know these are, these are things yeah i know this is uh so at anyway, least i improved to like 1900 or 1890 or something uh 1820 1820 let's shut up be, move on this is stick, stick with rally here don um look uh <laughs> look uh the, the usual players are kicking off very well. Uh, so we've got Peanut in the winter march uh, kicking off with the 2200, uh, knocking off at TGFC, who, uh, who line up against the Magoos next week. Um, uh, we've got uh, the Magoos. I've just got the chocolates over um, Sanders. Um, and looking a bit dicey there with uh, Fife going down. The donkey was only wasn't, – wasn't sure she was going to get over the line, but we got there in the end, so very happy. Uh, yeah, Phoenix only lost his first game by 300 points. So, uh, well done, Phoenix. You've um, you pulled up your stuff there. You the, you're the Carlton of our league. Thanks, man. Uh, the bad <laughs> the bad men um, uh, getting up over getting up over um, Sam Crow. Uh, we got Fab 33 with a decent effort out against High Country Crows. Uh, we've got the Bucketeers um, who went down to um, footy and facial hair. Um, we've got Azza, who's uh, just absolutely destroyed Dennis in uh, by about six hundred points. So he's your saving grace. Is <laughs> the fact that Dennis is the competition uh, fiend. Um, he's a uh, plant. Game of... I, I actually, <laughs> well, I actually put him in under my name, and like it's my second <laughs> team, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pick anyone. That was that. That's actually the team you're trying in, isn't it? <laughs> 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 we've got a game Sorry, of you're breaking up. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Really? Uh, game of Sloans coming in over, it was only 19. And uh, mixed spuds going down to Dylan FCC. So the, the big players from last season all uh, are going strong. Uh, Donkeys have managed to get a win, but still not in the eight. Um, so that's a little bit sad. Uh, next week, we've got some pretty decent matchups, I think, ahead of us. But um, um, I can't remember how to flick to that quickly. So we might just leave it. Um, and then if you have a look at tipping, um, unfortunately, I can't read who's at the top of the ladder, so that's oh, unfortunate. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I can tell uh, you. A bit blurry. No, nah, no, nah, it's, it's, it's just really blurry. So Mixed Buds comes at number two. <laughs> <laughs> we got four, 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 three. <laughs> Matt, Matt's, Matt's in fourth uh, on 16. Um, I... And uh, Phoenix is coming in at, at uh, the top of the Crowcast tippers that I can see, except for maybe because <laughs> I can't see the top of the ladder. But anyway, uh, Phoenix has come in with 16. Uh, Phoenix only got four last week. I forgot to put my tips in and got five. So uh, I think you've done that around the wrong way. Uh, no, yeah, it, no, it deserves <laughs> being right because he slagged me off for being fifth last week. And yeah. Uh, look, yeah, the real whatever. drama of the tipping competition is that we've got Moyley coming in here at, at 14 and J-Mac uh, all the way down in 12th on 13 and 15. Yeah. So um, uh, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know whether they're, they're just uh, – they've got a bit of rust in the start of the season. They've been they've been calling up Burton and Don Pike for their tipping, their tipping ideas. And, I think they're uh, just tipping the crows. Here's, Here's the thing. Maybe they're tipping the crows. Here's the thing, J Mac got six last week and he's still down on thirteen. So what the hell was he doing for the first two rounds? Yeah, J Mac, you've got some questions, Mark. Just to remember, you don't get any extra points next season for tanking. So look, you've got to <laughs> run it out really hard. Uh, but all jokes aside, congratulations to Nikki on top of the ladder. Um, and um, and uh, Macca uh, nowhere to be seen. No, nah, no Macca and no Pete. Miss Pete, if you don't join this one, no Pete no. didn't join. Ah. Anyway, thanks, uh, thanks, Donkey. Uh, that was wonderful. <laughs> Come on, Maka. Yeah, well, I've certainly got a few uh, for the sweet. So I want to thank and uh, consider uh, sweet to St. Kilda, the Gold Coast, Frio, and the Bulldogs for getting a a two-game break above the uh, rivals for the bottom spot in Carlton. And uh, if we go to get our act together and the, these other teams can just keep Carlton where they belong, then we could have a very good result at the end of the year. But it started off very nicely in that respect. Um, that's the only sweet I've got. But I've got plenty of smacks. Um, and we've discussed <laughs> quite a few of them. The first one is our coaching panel, and for very obvious reasons, so I won't go through it all. But, Jesus, we've got, some, we've got problems there. 
the second one he goes to Andrew Fagan, a great big smack for breaking a promise. You told us you were going to get the best people if every position within the club. Well, in 2018, you proved that with Birdman that you didn't. And uh, before that with Reed, who was Sauce's bitch, and he first uh, go wearing an L plate trying to do trade. And then we've got Hart now forward line. So a great big smack to you for lying, Andrew Fagan. You just lied. Um, the third one goes to Brian Taylor. Um, cool. He was trying, talking about a player with a... Do you want to just chuck an, an allegedly in that? Maka? Well, Andrew, um, Andrew Fagan. Allegedly. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, allegedly. The, the views of uh, Maka do not necessarily reflect those of the remainder of the podcast crew and and or Crowcast. <laughs> he did make that. He did make that statement. Yeah, um, but allegedly. it's subjective uh, to Brian, say that he subject. No, go on. It's my opinion. I'm allowed to have an opinion. Yeah, I know. But Anyhow, Brian, lying, Brian Taylor, saying he lied is a strong statement. He you mis- probably, you could probably, he mis- you could probably Let's say he is. Too. I believe he misled us. No, you could probably say that he's failed so far. Well, I'll go he hasn't, that. hasn't delivered. <laughs> hasn't delivered. Thank you. I, re- I withdraw the line and replace it with you haven't delivered. You haven't, folks. Uh, Brian Taylor talking about a player who had a big tease up mop of hair. And Brian, trying to be an intellectual, was trying to say the word boofop, but he ended up saying he had a boffin style haircut. Well, there was only one boffin, Brian, and that was you. Um, and uh, what else we have on the list? We've got uh, the AFL for the Melbourne tanking episode, and that's been discussed in plenty of detail. And lastly, um, the diving, at the, at the uh, players diving for the ball and players going over the top. I don't think there's anything wrong with a particular rule. It's the umpire's interpretation of the rule in the sense that if the player is already there and got the ball, he has not dived on the ball. So umpires, you'll get a smack for your ridiculous interpretation of allowing players to run in and then they roll over gently over the top of the player that he's got the ball and get a free kick. It looks stupid and it's a joke and you guys do a great big slap. Macca, it is actually the rule, the way they've written the rule. It's not the interpretation. It is the rule in that rule, any any, con- has, any contact below the knee is a free kick. I thought it had about after sliding in. No, nah. no, it got changed. We that talked is, about that earlier. Got changed. Well, if it, mm. then I'll smack them all. Anyway, it's thanks for that. Bloody, it is bloody ridiculous. Thanks for that, Macca. That was uh, that was uh, inspiring um, and uh, somewhat disconcerting and. Uh, I'm just getting on the phone to our lawyers now, uh, just to see where we stand. Uh, look, American we'll, Crow's in the chat. Is it? <laughs> yeah, I don't know whether he can operate in this jurisdiction. Does anyone think we're uh, going to lose against North Melbourne this weekend? Yep. No. No. I've got, I've got no idea. I really haven't. <laughs> I'll put it this way: on paper, there's no way we should lose to North Melbourne. Um, what what Pete's really saying is. I think you're saying the same, Pete, but you fear that they still could manage to do it. I think I'd actually tip us this week. Mm. Well, there's well, one thing I mean, that North... I, Sorry, go, Don. Go. I was going to say, if we don't win this week, I don't think we can win the flag this year. Oh, that's a big turnaround. You've gone from up and about to just doom and gloom. I, the one thing that North have got in their favour is that uh, the coach has got a brother who's worked us out a long time ago. Um, so if they happen to get together for a coffee on Thursday before selection, then that might do us in a little bit. Look, I think we'll beat North. Um, they've got a couple of key outs. I think Mason Wood out hurts them, uh, and apparently he had a setback in the twos last week, so he yeah, may not be he back. Got injured. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, it's going to be a struggle. Anyway, selection on Thursday will be interesting, and Cam and I will be uh, putting together our rev up show, which will. Uh, uh, go live uh, about halfway through. When are we playing? Saturday or Sunday? Saturday. Saturday night. Saturday night. Saturday night. So it'll go. Yes, NFL. Yes, NFL Eagles on Saturday afternoon. Yeah. So the rev up show will be online. Uh, look out for that around lunchtime on Saturday. Give you something to look at and listen to uh, uh, before you get ready for the Crows. And of course, we'll be back on Sunday night for the wrap show with Macca and Nikki, hopefully with some good news to talk about. In the meantime, I have to say thank you to all our patrons. Uh, and particularly, I need to say a big thank you to uh, Tim, uh, aka Scorpus, uh, 
uh, who made a very generous donation to Crowcast during the week. Uh, uh, Scorpus runs a YouTube channel called uh, Hardware Unboxed and it's uh, very successful and it's very informative if you ever need to uh, have a look at a review for a piece of technology uh, then Hardware Unbo Unboxed on Facebook or Hardware Unboxed on YouTube. Um, it's an excellent uh, show and thank you very much to Scorpus and everyone uh, who's donated to the Crowcast and who supports Crowcast through Patreon. If you want to support us, just head to patreon.com forward slash AFL Crowcast or click the Patreon button on our website at aflcrowcast.com. That's all for me for tonight. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Pete, Mac and Nicky and Thanks, Donkey. Go, go Crows. We'll see you Thursday night. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah, good night all. Night all.